Um, so we're going to be talking about the work that we've been doing in the Zacatecas district, um, just north of Zacatecas city and the state of Zacatecas. Um, this disclaimer here that we must place as a Canadian company. Um, to set the scene a little bit, uh, and just to point out where exactly the project area is, it's this, uh-oh. Uh is this yellow star here, kind of at the triple junction between these different uh, sort of tectonic terrains, which to me is always a good sign in terms of, of potential for large scale mineralization, which we know to be true in the, in the Zacatecas and Fresnillo blocks here. And uh, you can see that it sits at the boundary of uh, the Sierra Madre Occidental Volcanics and uh, heading off into this more sedimentary package to the east here. This is a, a kind of rainbow color scheme diagram of the stratigraphy in the area. So the oldest rocks in the stratigraphy uh, are red and uh, kind of going through the rainbow and the youngest rocks are purple. Um, this is the color scheme that uh, some colleagues in, came up with when we were working at First Quantum. And uh, it really helps you to see where there are breaks or missing stratigraphic units or to pick the structures uh, in basins with your eyes. And one of the things that I thought was the most interesting when I did this exercise here was that it became clear that there's, there's a structural block here that contains both Fresnillo and Zacatecas, indicating that these systems uh, have a shared geologic history. Uh, to zoom a little in a little bit, uh, in the state of Zacatecas, here is the capital, and just north of the capital, near to the town of Vita Grande, uh, on the Vita Grande structure, uh, is our, our project, just to the east of the main historic Vita Grande mine. Uh, you can see in the light blue color here are the projects that are uh, held by Defiant Silver. And uh, the dark blue is an option that we have with Pan American on this ground in the district. Momentita. <laughs> a little bit of an overview just of the geology of the area. Um, the sort of main non-cropping rocks up here is the Chilitos Formation, which is a volcano sedimentary package. Um, and you can see that, at least in this diagram, there's sort of a number of main vein systems, um, more or less sort of east-west or, or northwest-southeast, uh, sort of north off of this particular map is the area of the Lucita project, but the veins remain in a similar orientation. And uh, it's kind of all, as far as, as we understand, the veins sort of from here to the north are, are part of the same mineral system. Um, but the veins down here that are sort of more north-south are part of a later mineral system. Um, and these veins in the north are more intermediate sulfation style with uh, silver, lead, and zinc um, as the, the dominant minerals. And the El Arito system down here is a gold dominant system. Um, to point out down here in the bottom, it's a, a bit of a schematic section through the divine systems in the district. And uh, these two vein systems here um, are the uh, Lucita, Palenque, and um, the Panuco area. This is the main Beta Gandhi structure, which is one of the biggest structures that you can see in the regional magnetics. It's the most obvious structure. It is a very important and probably quite deep crustal structure. Um, just a bit of an overview of the stratigraphy and kind of speaking to the figure we saw before. Um, on the right hand side is a strat column for the state of Zacatecas. And uh, on the left hand side is a strat column more for the, the Zacatecas block itself and the area in which we work. And for me, one of the things that I thought was notable was that it, it appears to have a compressed stratigraphic sequence. Um, this Chilitos formation, which is really Jurassic to Cretaceous in age, um, is sitting directly on, on the Triassic basement. Um, it, it, so far as it outcrops, we're missing the stratigraphy, though potentially in some of the basins off of the main outcropping block, some of these carbonates do exist. 
um, and then sort of going up from there, all of this upper stratigraphy that outcrops more in the Conception del Oro district uh, is also missing from this portion uh, of the district. So we have the bottom of our unconformity. I don't know if you can see this right here, um, just underneath the Chilitos, and then the top of the, the Jurassic Arc unconformity here um, with sort of mm, post art conglomerate sitting on top. And just a bit of a, to kind of place you in time and space here. Um, I think in terms of the most important for this particular conversation is that uh, we had um, the sort of Jurassic Arc um, that accreted to the continent. And uh, it's very hard to see the screen from here. <laughs> Can I take this out of here? Okay. Got it. All right, that's, that's much better. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I, is really interesting and, and kind of important in this district is that um, there is subduction-related magmatism that begins around 51 MA, um, and this appears to be related to sort of a scarn style copper silver mineralization event that um, is evident at the Cozumel mine that Capstone is operating, um, just to the sort of south south west of, of our project. Um, sort of following that, there's a there's a number of, of pulses of mineralization between that time and approximately 42 MA when this subduction related magmatism ends here. It's actually part of a, it seems to be related to far field forces changing the stress regime and then the tectonic picture of the area is shifting. Um, sort of following on that, you do get some of this um, younger or sort of intermediate age of, of mineralization, um, more of the age that you see north in Durango and uh, sort of in the Teotita district. Um, closer to 30 MA, 29 MA, and these are those north-south structures that are gold-rich um, that I pointed out on the map before. Um, I quite like this photo. This is an old photo of the last time that uh, uh, the San Acasio mine was operating. That's the Perusa Montano, and uh, it sure looks like a different time. So I guess one of the things that we started the whole premise of this exploration program on was that we weren't just looking for a vein, we were looking for a mineral system. And particularly in districts that are world class, like the Zacatecas Fresno district, I think it's really important to think about the system as, as a whole, rather than just looking at individual veins. And I think mostly because a lot of the land package has not been consolidated and has been operated by many different businesses, it hasn't been explored as a system. And so one of the goals that we have had is to start to try and consolidate the district and, and approach it with a systematic data-driven exploration program, thinking about the system rather than just a small piece of the system. A lot of the sort of historic uh, view was that the mineralization was fairly simple. It was hosted in one structure. Um, but uh, the more that we kind of look at the data and start to understand the rocks of it better, it's, uh, it's not quite so simple as that, and <laughs> it never is, but I think that's one of the big leaps that we can make, is taking a project from where we believe that it's simple to understanding the complexity. Um, and at that point, you really start to be able to, to target events or target mineralization or target ore shoots in a way that was previously not possible. Um, and so we've been sort of three years working towards this, and in a perfect world, we would have been able to do sort of everything in order, <laughs> but that doesn't always happen. So we've been doing a lot of this kind of compilation and validation work and uh, learning about the rocks in the district as we were drilling. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's been really cool because we've had breakthroughs that kind of come in phases and kind of aha moments where like, oh, as things are really starting to make sense, we understand that uh, the things that are anecdotally spoken about in the district, um, we can actually start to see them in the data. 
and is really, really important for localizing the mineralization here. All right. One of the first large projects that we undertook was to begin doing a surface mapping program. And not just mapping, but surface data collection with data points with the have metadata that are standardized. Um, and that process was led by Dr. Stephanie Sikora, who's somewhere in this room, um, and uh, Marisela Rodriguez from HESS. And uh, we collect all of the data in QField with digital data collection, but also map by hand at the same time. And then all of those maps are then digitized and integrated with the digital data. And uh, the interpretation uh, takes kind of all of these points uh, into maps that sort of look like this. And our goal was to kind of cover the whole area to really understand the context of, of the sort of San Nicasio portion, which is here. It's the sort of main resource area and the historic mine. Um, with this area here, um, this is another vein here called Tejores. And uh, this is the Palenque vein system, which is part of the Lucita package. And so we wanted to kind of gather all the data and look at this as a system rather than trying to think about it as different pieces. Um, one of the really early things that was an aha moment for us was there was a preliminary map. And uh, previous to us being there, there wasn't any systematic mapping or any type of map that you could use in a constructive way. And uh, Stephanie and I started just roughly modeling up the faults that have been mapped at surface. Um, neither of us are modelers, but just sort of drawing a plane and leapfrog and eyeballing it in there. And what we started to notice was that it looked like where there were sort of, it's really hard to see on the screen. So the main structure is here, but there's a number of cross structures that come sort of this way that you can map at surface. And where those cross structures and the main Veda Grande structure um, were projected to intercept at death, a lot of the historic drilling had hit much higher grade mineralization. And so it sort of put us on the path of starting to be able to see what is anecdotally known in the district that like some of the veins are only profitable where the cross structures hit the main structure. And uh, it's probably, as we've progressed, things have just gotten more and more clear. But it's kind of, it's been really fun to kind of hear the stories and then see them actually become a reality in the data. So after we did the regional mapping, um, it became clear that we were missing some really important information in the main resource area and the exposed vein. And uh, Mary and Stephanie started leading a program to, to map at a, a much finer scale and really understand where the vein pinches and swells at surface, where there are veinlet zones in the hanging wall and footwall, and what are the structures that you can actually map uh, at surface. And for me, one of the really interesting things, and we'll see if it kind of holds up, is there's a lot of structures that kind of cross more or less north-northwest or north-northeast, but kind of north. Um, but there are sometimes structures that are actually northeast. And when you look in some of the zones, um, and if you look at the geophysics for the district, these are our original deep crustal scale structures. And they're really difficult to see at surface most of the time, but they seem to be exerting some kind of control on where the later faults are, are crossing the system. And those are the locations where, where you tend to get the better mineralization. So that's kind of like an inherited architecture that's driving the architecture of the younger systems. So I think one of the most important things that we have been able to do is we've had the liberty to have a phase approach to do some drilling, take a break, compile the data, do some mapping, relog some holes, wait for the assays, process everything, and like really take the time to integrate and understand the data before we start drilling again. And that's really led to us having a lot of success. Um, something on the order of 90% of our holes have it the intended structure. It's not always mineralized, but we're kind of angling in on that and, and really starting to build a model. We have a new new modeler working for us and uh, all of what we've been doing has been kind of funneling towards this new model, which we're in the process of making now and, and it's really quite exciting. Um, so we're hoping that the better model that we have, the better 
results that we'll get with our drilling. Um, the method of drilling and, and what we do with the data collection has been one of the main things that's given us so much success. Um, we have been working with Chris Brown from OTS and uh, doing uh, triple tube oriented core drilling. I've done oriented core drilling in the past uh, without triple tube and it was a nightmare, <laughs> but triple tube drilling is the best. Um, the rock comes out of the hole more or less in the position that it was in the ground and they kind of pump it out, open the clamshell and you can see the rock in the most pristine form that you'll ever be able to see it. And uh, we have every shift, we have uh, either a young geo or a geotech. They're doing the ORI logging procedure that Chris has developed. And uh, it's a way to kind of QAQC the actual ORI lines and the ORI marks, which I'm sure you guys heard about in Chris's talk, but it's been, it's been really, really good. It's really allowed us to, to have confidence in our ORI data and also to, to have confidence then in the structural measurements associated with that. Um, following that, we have a fairly extensive data collection procedure that goes on in the logging. Um, everything's collected digitally into MX Deposit um, as a database. Um, a sort of logging a quick log, the orientation, lithology, the Vivian and Breccia log, a structure table, and, and particularly the structures. Logging, <laughs> we struggled at first. Um, but Chris is really diligent coming to site and having those really important conversations with us about what data are we focusing on collecting. And now we're to the point where, um, you know, if our, if our structure loggers see even a thin valent that has the correct mineralogy, we're measuring those structures because that's actually telling us something about the orientation of the system. Even if we're not in the big part of the system, it's telling us what is the orientation of the structures that carry the grade that we care about. Um, we also do RQD, excess density, and uh, I've tried to convince them to let me assay the whole hole, but it hasn't happened yet. So uh, we <laughs> take quite a lot of uh, XRF readings and uh, we're just beginning to integrate that data with our four asset digest, um, sort of MEMS 61 package that we get uh, from ALS. So this is just an example of, of one of the things that we've learned during this process. On the left-hand side is, is kind of a historic interpretation that we had. And it was following along with what was believed to be understood in the district, that there was a main vein and then parallel veins in the hanging wall. However, um, upon doing further relogging and, and really using the structures to understand what is the orientation of, of these zones, what it actually looks like is that we have sort of the main vein structure and then a series of hanging wall splays and a number of low angle faults that are impacting upon the geometry and the, and the mineralogy of the veins here. And so we're sort of in the infancy of really kind of integrating this work and, and continuing to do this type of work um, in terms of reinterpretation and, and uh, these sections that Stephanie has made. Um, sort of this is mainly focused in the northwestern portion of the project, which is the main sort of center of the resource zone. Um, but we are going to work our way east through the deposit and, and really start to kind of get everything linked together. And uh, we're kind of using these sections to guide some of the modeling, and so far that's going really well. Something that's taking quite a lot of time and we've been working on in order to have a, a really good model is, is just sort of historic data compilation and validation. This is something that people have attempted in the past, but I think as the project advances, it becomes more and more important to have data that is more and more correct. There are levels of correctness, um, and I think we're at the point where the data needs to be pretty much exactly correct. And, and we're really, really close, as close as we can get, I think, and uh, that's been really exciting. So we have now all the data cleaned from sort of every data set, and uh, I have gone undertaking, a, almost finished relogging all of the historic holes um, once we figured out what the pathologies were. Um, so we should have a, a good, sort of consistent and clean data set uh, for our model that we're, we're working on now. One of the really interesting things that came out of, of some of this work uh, was that we undertook a validation program, the underground workings, the historic workings. And uh, it, was quite, it was quite a big task. There was lots of paper maps and, and paper, paper plans. 
and uh, paper sections, and they all needed to be scanned and found and digitized, and uh, not just georeferenced, but actually like digitized. So we've been working to, oh no, that's the wrong one, okay. Um, this was a hand-drawn section with colors, and now it's polygons and points with structural data. And so we're in the process of integrating all of this underground data that was previously not digitized and not usable in LeapFrog uh, into our model. And uh, during this process, we found a number of maps that we had never seen before. And it indicated that sort of towards the end of the mine operation, um, sort of the historical understanding was that from about where this, this tunnel is here, there was no more workings. Um, but because if you drill just directly, directly east of here, the mineralization isn't there. But, and we long suspected that the mineralization was shifted somehow, but we didn't have a lot of data in this area. And what we found was actually that they, they appeared to be mining um, deep over here. Can you see this pointer? No, let's go over here. Um, deep over here. What's that? Oh yeah, okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, so kind of historically it was understood that all of the workings and all of the mineralization was cut off from this point. Um, and uh, as you move eastward um, through this deposit, the, the level of the system gets deeper and deeper. Sort of in the main Veda Grande zone, where is the main historic mine, um, it's probably exposed at its deepest crustal level. And then as you move sort of laterally in that, in that horse block, more or less you are exposed at higher, higher levels in the system. And so the surface expression is poor here. Um, but to what we also learned, um, from some of the modeling that we did with Chris Brown of, of the structural data from the drilling is that the main Veda Grande structure continues in this way, but there's a whole fan of splays that come out this way. Um, and uh, that was interesting. And then we found this data and they line up pretty much exactly. So one of the things that we're in the process of doing is modeling, modeling this area and we plan to drill this in our next program. And the other thing that's really cool about Glockatikas is there are many, many historic mines scattered throughout the city, um, near to the bike park, near to the skate park, in the eco park to go walking in. And uh, some of the things that we do in the evenings, at least I do, <laughs> is go and check out some of these mines. And one of the things that I was noticing was that, uh, and I can see this from my house, is that there's a, there's a huge vein here, part of the Cantera system. You can see it here. All of this material is is barren at surface. It is an enormous volume of quartz and chalcedony breccia. Um, and this is one of the areas where anecdotally, it was only mineable where cross structures entered um, the Cantera structure. Um, and what you see, you can actually uh, get into some of the adits there. And what you see, not only do you see this red, not only do you see this, that this red vein here was mined, at surface, you can see there are shafts here. It's actually dipping moderately to the west. Um, but when you come in here, along this main structure, there's not a lot of mines until you get near this area. And then the mine that's in this zone, along this kind of really quartz rich structure is, is small and not very impressive. But uh, if you kind of wander back in here, you can see into this stope and it opens up and it's quite big. And, and what they were actually mining here was this sort of more north, northwest training structure. And that's gonna become sort of really important um, as we started to look at the data on our property as well. Um, if anyone has any data about what was mined out of this vein, I'd love to know, um, because uh, I have been unable, unable to find anything, but uh, quite keen to understand what they were mining here, because it seems to have significant implications for which structures are mineralized in the district. And if you look around in the district, there are m several structures that are very large that were mined, more or less in this north northwest or north northeast direction. And uh, that hasn't really been, with the exception of the younger system, in El Arito, which I think is different to these, um, it hasn't really been noted, but clearly they were mining it in a number of places and the mines were large. So this is something that uh, we've noticed in the district and we're following up on our property and the data is trying to, to kind of point us in a direction. Uh, 
So one of the other things that we noted, particularly on some of the historic drill sections and also in these mines that you can visit um, around the town, is that the main structure that's very obvious, like that big barren quartz structure, it's obvious where it goes, it has a direction you can trace, um, but it seems very barren. Um, but when you go wandering around, what you see is that uh, they were actually mining inside of this big vein on some type of structure or event that was in a slightly different or oblique orientation. And what we notice in our drilling is that sometimes we would encounter large vein or breccia zones, um, but they were poorly mineralized. And we really were trying to understand which phases or which parts of the system were actually carrying the grade. And uh, so some of the work that we've been undertaking, um, and really driven by Stephanie as well, um, was to kind of go through and, and see if we could pick out what are these different phases, which ones came first, which ones came later, and uh, then trying to understand, can we figure out which ones contain the grade? And kind of what we learned is that, uh, oh no, um, sort of the thing at the top is the bladed calcite event. It's carrying substantial silver grade. Um, but not much else, really. Um, and we think it's earlier, but we don't have much of it. I think this is what they were mining in the historic mine. Um, so there's not a lot of this material left. Um, and uh, what we also learned is that uh, there is an amethyst event that is strongly associated with high silver grade, which anecdotally was known in the district. But I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, the amethyst is late, it's barren. There is a later amethyst event that is barren. But there are two events. Um, and uh, I don't need to go in kind of detail through that, but the really important thing also that we started to understand was this pirate sphalerite event. You can see it in the core, you can see it in the geochemistry. It is usually f more than five or seven percent pyrite, more than that probably. Um, and uh, it's a very strongly a, a pyrite event and uh, it contains zinc and gold. Um, we're still working to understand what are the controls on, on where you have good grade and where it's more barren. And hopefully we'll be able to address that in our next drill program. Um, so this was really kind of important to us starting to understand well, how are we going to target our next drill program. Don't just step up to the main structure and stick a hole along it because that's what people believed in the past and we've learned that that's not it's not the most effective methodology because there are phases in there that aren't mineralized and uh, that the mineralized phases are at slightly different angles. So our goal is to really model those up and then drill the grade structures, not the main structures. Um, just to see a couple of photos here. Um, also, you can come to our core shack. We have a lot of these rocks there. Um, we, yeah, so it's kind of, a lot of devices here. Um, this is the kind of early bladed calcite event. Well, kind of calcite, maybe bladed. Um, this is the dark amethyst with the silver. This sample here ran, f ran around 1,400 grams per ton silver. Um, this is the pyrite sphalerite event. Um, you can see the class of, of other, other events, including amethyst in here. Um, and this is a milled breccia, which is often quite gougy, um, and it tends to reflect the grade of whatever it ground up. Um, this is more of the kind of barren amethyst and sort of like quartz event that really dilutes um, certain portions of the area. And uh, we're still working to understand what is the significance of this sort of carbonate, iron carbonate oxide unit. Um, it seems to be associated with those like shallowly dipped north dipping faults, um, and there's a late calcite, dolomite, anchorite, plus or minus marcosite event uh, that uh, is either sort of the last gas of the system or, or the top of another system. We'll find out. Uh, just, there's only a couple of more slides here just to kind of show some of the things that uh, have come out of this work. And uh, so this, this section over here is um, where we drilled into a new ore chute using this methodology. Um, and this, here you can see there's the purple is the amethyst zone and it's quite wide. Um, and there's good grade in the hanging wall and associated with the amethyst. Um, and then as you move to the east, um, it's this one in the middle and then this one here. And what you can see is that zone of damage associated with those hanging wall splays. It goes from being very wide and having good grade 
to getting narrow and narrow and narrower until it actually comes into the structure itself and then actually passes into the foot wall. And the grade is with the amethyst and the foot wall as you go to the east. And so we're still trying to understand exactly what is the significance of this, but the easiest explanation is that you actually have a more east-west structure um, that's blind at surface um, that is carrying good grade, and that's not dissimilar to what you see in Fresno. Um, so this is another thing we're going to model and test in this next drill program. Um, the other thing that really kind of came out of looking at these, this data and making sure that people are logging sphalerite and galena where they see them in the structural log is that even if the grade is poor because there's only a small veinlet, so you can say, okay, well, I just want to look at everything that has sphalerite logged or everything that has galena logged. And uh, I flag this because <laughs> the grade of the intercept was very good. It's very polymetallic. Um, and I started looking at the data, and, and what we see here is that uh, this kind of pyrite sphalerite event um, appears to be kind of west dipping, and that's exactly what we see um, in that uh, exposure near to the Cantera vein in the park. And so we're hoping that uh, we're going to use some of this data and model up what we think is the structure, and then turn the rig and actually drill a structure that's in a different orientation to what people have drilled in the past. Um, and so I, we're really excited for the next drill program, excited to get this model going, uh, working towards getting another resource estimate out, but uh, we've got to get the model in order and drill a few more holes first. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much.